Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, today is the time shows in my time is 1 p.m. on Jakarta time. Welcome to this uh, webinar that presented by the ASEAN Legal Studies Faculty of Law, Universitas Indonesia, which under the coordination of Joko Sukono Research Center. My name is Ari Afriansha, and I will be the host uh, for this uh, webinar today. Um, this webinar will be uh, using uh, English as a language of instruction. So despite that uh, most of the participants are Indonesian, uh, we would like to uh, have your permission uh, to use the English as the language of instruction. Um, we uh, first uh, would like to inform you that uh, all the participants' video and the microphone will be turned off, uh, except uh, the speakers and uh, the um, the uh, committee. Okay. First, uh, I would like to welcome uh, Professor Andri uh, Gunawan Wibisana. He is the vice dean for Academic Affairs of the Faculty of uh, Faculty of Law Universitas Indonesia. Welcome, Professor Andri. And we would like also to welcome uh, uh, Mr. Muhammad Nofrizal, Professor Tan Shen Li, Professor uh, Ponchai Witsutia, Witsutisak, uh, forgive me my pronunciation, and will be joining us later um, um, Professor Ta Tran Fit Jung. Yeah. Before I continue uh, uh, for the session, I would like to introduce to all of the participants that uh, the center, the ASEAN Legal Studies, is a, a research cluster under the Joko Sutono Research Center, which uh, the uh, research uh, for mainly for the Faculty of Law Universitas Indonesia. But uh, this center is quite inclusive because it is across um, departments in which they involve uh, from uh, many uh, researchers and also lecturers from uh, the faculty. But the center is also welcome to all of the uh, academicians and researchers that would like to join us because uh, ASEAN and the development of law within uh, the organization is so much developed uh, from time to time. And we are so privileged that uh, here we have uh, the speakers that have a long uh, track records in uh, researching about ASEAN and the law itself. The center uh, have and will conducted uh, many uh, activities such as research, workshop, seminars, publications, uh, especially that uh, we often give uh, the government to have a, a policy papers and so on. And without further ado, I think the time is uh, running so fast. And I would like to give the uh, opportunity for the vice dean to give uh, his remarks. Professor Andri, please. Thank you very much, uh, Pari. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, can you hear me? Or yes. Okay. Uh, so first, uh, let me express the dean's apologies for not being able to uh, open this webinar. So uh, he asked me to uh, to open this, this webinar. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of the Faculty of Law, uh, Universitas Indonesia, in this international web webinar, the importance of uh, regional legal cooperation during the time of pandemic of COVID-19. Uh, I am delighted to announce that this webinar is, is also a soft launching of Asian legal studies, as Pari mentioned before, under the uh, uh, coordination organization of uh, Joko Sutono Research Center. These initiatives 
This initiative aims to integrate the regional legal studies, research, and academics, particularly uh, in Southeast Asia countries. First of all, I would like to express my uh, gratitude and a special welcome to the speakers of this webinar. Uh, uh, we have here uh, Muhammad Dovrizal uh, Bang Isal from uh, our faculty, uh, Faculty of Law Universitas Indonesia, Ms. Tan Sin Lee from uh, National University of Singapore, Mr. Ponchai Witutisak from Chiang Mai University, and Mr. Tran Fit Sung from uh, Ho Chi Minh City University. Sorry for my pronunciation. Uh, today, uh, as we uh, all know, we are facing a global health crisis unlike any other problem in the 70 years history of the United Nations. Uh, the crisis that has detrimental effects on the global economy, upending people's life and causing human sufferings. The threat of this global pandemic is transnational in nature and hence regional and multilateral cooperation will be required in this unprecedented, uh, unprecedentedly difficult time. Given that each country is facing different legal conditions, the regional cooperation, particularly legal cooperation, is, is of highly importance, allowing us to share and learn from each other the measures and policies in each country in fighting and mitigating the COVID-19. As we are probably aware of, the measures and policies in combating the COVID-19 could potentially jeopardize active investment and slow down our economy. The changes of legal frameworks inevitably affect the corporate governance, cor consumer and investor protections, patents and intellectual property rights, product liability uh, and privacy issues and so on. Those issues constitute another reason of why it is very crucial for ASEAN countries to cooperate during this difficult time. As member of ASEAN, Indonesia has a moral obligation to help each other in research and discussion and to promote legal aspect of regional and international cooperation. Therefore, the Faculty of Law Universitas Indonesia launches a research institution under the supervision and administration of our Joko Sutono Research Centers, aiming to promote research and discussion, discussions concerning the legal aspect uh, of ASEAN. Uh, personally, I would like to congratulate Ibu Ririn, Pak Ari, and colleagues for the launch of such an important research center. I truly look forward for brilliant and useful papers and studies from this center. I also hope that this webinar can create regional legal cooperation during the time of pandemic COVID-19, of which benefits we can reap and share together. Finally, on behalf of the Faculty of Law, uh, we are deeply honored to be hosting this important webinar. webinar. For sure, we will strive to make it a success. Thank you very much. Thank you and enjoy the webinar. Thank you very much, Pak Andri. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, yes, indeed. Uh, we hope that uh, this center will flourish uh, to a bigger or even big, a very big, uh, large institution because we as uh, part of ASEAN is really, really need to develop at least in the part of the uh, legal development. Ladies and gentlemen, as uh, Professor Andre has mentioned that uh, the topic that we are going to um, uh, discuss uh, this afternoon is very important and unprecedented. The unprecedented notion is very important for us to bear because uh, it is so much hard for everyone, every country in the world to take care of or to tackle uh, this pandemic. And uh, indeed, uh, the cooperation between the states has become uh, what do you call it, um, really important, critically important. But it seems that from the development, we know from the news that everybody seems uh, a bit, um, 
what to call it, uh, not to have a firm uh, position, especially when the big states are in uh, in crossing to each other. We know that uh, the United States and the China have uh, arguing uh, on their position, whereas the WHO uh, in the middle. In the min in the meantime, uh, there are other cooperation, such as the regional cooperation, in which. Uh, ASEAN, since its establishment, has proved that uh, we have settled many uh, uh, issues together. Despite that, uh, the the well known of ASEAN way has been criticized or has been uh, proposed to be reformed. That uh, still uh, this uh, notion or this concept uh, still exists up until now. If I may quote. Uh, from the website of the uh, WHO uh, this morning, uh, still Indonesia, uh, compared to uh, the countries from the speakers uh, of today, still have the highest numbers in which, if I may quote, uh, 33,000 cases with, with 1,923 mortality. It is followed by the Singapore which a bit higher in the cases, 38,000 uh, cases, but with 25 mortality. Then Thailand would have a confirmed case of 3,125, but with 58 deaths. And lastly, Vietnam with only 332 cases with no mortality. This case shows that we can learn from each other and we can learn uh, how the states uh, have uh, respond to this pandemic. Because as we know that the numbers of the cases globally is still increasing. We still don't know when the vaccine of the COVID-19 will be uh, invented. But in the meantime, I think the economy cannot wait any longer. Uh, therefore, uh, we have to be able to have this cooperation for mostly, of course, to find the vaccine. But in the meantime, the economy or the show of everything must go on, right? We, I think uh, we don't have uh, much time to uh, delay more on our uh, uh, our nature as a social uh, being to have a cooperation to each other. Okay. I guess that's all we're going to uh, discuss and we're going to hear from the speakers. And thus, I would like to uh, read to you the CV of the speakers. First is Mr. Mohamed Nafrizal. He is the senior lecturer in our faculty, uh, Universitas Indonesia, and he is also the senior lecturer at our graduate school and strategic of and global studies at our university. He's also the senior lecturer for the Center for Constitutional Law Studies. And uh, he is also the PhD candidate at the Rijks Universiteit Groningen at the Netherlands. And we are very privileged that uh, Mr. Nafrizal is uh, the one who's leading uh, the ASEAN legal studies. Uh, he's also previously uh, become the consultant of the Provincial Representatives Council. And he also being involved in the um, broadcasting uh, industry as a news broadcaster, and also now still becoming the resource person for constitutional law issues for TV national news program. Secondly, our colleague, Assistant Professor Tan Xin Li, she was until recently a senior research fellow and executive director of the ASEAN Integration Through Law Project at the Center of International Law, National University of Singapore. Uh, she holds degrees from London School of Economics, Nottingham University and National University of Singapore. Uh, Shin Lee has held a fellowship at the European University Institute, Florence, the Jean Monnet Center for International and Regional Economic Law and Justice at the NYU School of Law. She was previously the Asian SEAL Research Fellow at the NUS School of Law 
and Ushiba Memorial Asian Fellow in Tokyo. Shin Lee researches on the role and rule of law and institution in asset integration, public international law, and particularly in norm creation as well as human rights. Uh, she has authored a books on ASEAN human rights and also uh, edited on ASEAN dispute settlement mechanisms. And she's working on the ASEAN instruments and the theory of ASEAN way. Well, I'm looking forward for your publication. Please correct me if the book is already uh, out there. She's also the editor of the Asian Journal of International Law and the general co-editor with Joseph Weiler of the Asian Integration Through Law Books series from Cambridge University Press. Next, our speakers from Vietnam, Professor Tan Phet Dung. He is a law professor and dean of the International Law Faculty of Ho Chi Minh City University of Law. His expertise in WTO law, international investment law, knowledge with practical experience as international lawyer. He was country manager of Qatar Wong in Vietnam from 2010 to 2014 and has been involved in works for uh, multinational companies as well as leading Vietnamese companies in their outbound investment and international trade matters. Currently, he is also work as a senior consultant at the Victory LLC where he has many consultancies for the multinational companies. He wrote many books, monographs and journal articles, of course. And lastly, we have Assistant Professor Dr. Pornchai Wisutisat. Uh, he is the Dean, Faculty of Law, Chiang Mai University. He holds a degree from Uni University of South Wales, Macquarie University, and Tamasat University, Thailand. His area research focus is on competition law, energy law and regulation, regulation on infrastructure utility, ASEAN, CLMV, and small medium enterprise regulations. And he holds professional affiliations uh, such as member of Thai Customer Broker Association, member of Young Competition Scholars at the Queen Mary University of London, member of ASEAN Competition Forum Groups in Competition Law in ASEAN Pacific Region, and country expert of franchise regulation in Thailand, International Distribute, Distri Distribution Institute. I guess from the brief uh, short bio, we know that uh, the speakers have no uh, undeniable, uh, have undeniable track record of the, uh, uh, the expertise. Okay, so without further ado, I would like to give uh, the, uh, the time for Mr. Muhammad uh, Nofrizal. And before that, I would like to remind to the participants, if you do have questions, please click on the link that uh, given on the chat box and mention your name, your affiliation, and uh, to whom the, the question is addressed to. You don't have to wait until the speakers finish their presentation. Uh, I will, uh, I will uh, choose and read your uh, question uh, afterwards. And for those who is uh, more convenient in writing in Bahasa, please do so, and I will translate it for you. Thank you very much, Mr. Nofrizal. Time is yours. Thank you. You are still muted. OK. Yeah. yeah thank, uh, you. thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ari Apriyansha. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, and also good afternoon to uh, the Vice Dean of the Faculty of Law, Universitas Indonesia, Professor Andri Wibisana. Uh, and also to our uh, friends, uh, our colleagues from uh, Singapore, uh, Professor Sin Lee, and also, Professor Pong Chai from uh, Thailand. Uh, I hope we can uh, soon meet with uh, Professor Chan Viet Zhu. Uh, I, uh, I think he, he, he's, he still has a problem with the internet line. Uh, but we really hope that 
he can join us soon. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm very happy uh, to meet all of you. And also, good afternoon, uh, all the uh, audiences, the participants of the uh, seminar. Uh, because I'm from Indonesia, I think I don't, I don't have to speak much about Indonesia uh, itself because um, most of the participants, majority of the participants, um, we uh, come from Indonesia. But uh, uh, I, will in, I, will, I, will, I will tell a little, a little bit about Indonesia to our uh, friends from uh, Thailand, from uh, Vietnam, and from uh, Singapore, of course. Uh, about uh, the situation in Indonesia uh, during the COVID-19. And so my presentation will uh, tell uh, uh, the Indonesian situation uh, as an introduction. And then uh, I will close my uh, presentation with an idea that I would like to propose for ASEAN in order to work uh, more closely and uh, stronger in the future. Uh, okay. Uh, and so the operator, we can start now uh, with uh, my presentation. Uh, please uh, go to the first page of my slides. Next, please. Next, please. Next, please. Yeah. Uh, I hope we all can read uh, this uh, uh, data, or it's not data, really data. It's not really data. It's just, it's just uh, some uh, some data. things that I would, I like, would to, like to uh, uh, show show you the situation, the situation in Indonesia. Indonesia. Uh, the first, uh, the first is about the, the challenges, challenges in Indonesia, Indonesia uh, that we face, face uh, uh, during, during this of the COVID nineteen outbreak. Uh, yeah, yeah. We have, we have uh, uh, this uh, final uh, fact in Indonesia. Yeah, the first, yeah, one, the first one. The about the population, population is about, about the population. population. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Indonesian, Indonesian population, population is the biggest, is the biggest in, in, in the Asian ASEAN. We have the biggest number of population among the ASEAN countries. Um, the number of population in Indonesia is about 273.5 million. Uh, so this is uh, about 42% of the ASEAN population itself, which is 600, around 650 million. And 53% of our population, uh, which is about 145 million, live in Java Island. While Java Island itself is actually only 6.7% uh, of the Indonesian land. So it's very, very densified in uh, Java Island. So very, very populated. Uh, I think it's the, one of the most populated uh, island in the world. And the other uh, fact is Indonesia is not just land like uh, uh, other uh, um, um, ASEAN member states. Only, uh, only I think uh, we, we we only have similarity with with, uh, with with the Philippines because the Philippines also islands, but we have more islands than the Philippines. Indonesia and the Philippines are the archipelagic uh, country, uh, while like uh, Vietnam, uh, Thailand, and other uh, Singapore and other uh, member states of ASEAN, um, they are all. Uh, most of the land, uh, most of the territory of the country is uh, is, is one land. In, we have more uh, than seventeen thousand five hundred islands, uh, but only uh, thirty percent of them are with inhabitants. But still, uh, big numbers of islands, of islands, about five thousand and two hundred and fifty islands. And situation today, uh, I, I take uh, the the the, num the data from yesterday uh, on 10 of June 2020. Um, we have uh, the 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 infected uh, people uh, with COVID-19 are located in 
Java Island is about 61% of uh, the whole uh, infected people. And the second uh, fact that we face in Indonesia is about culture. Yeah? Uh, we, it's, it's coincidentally yeah? the, 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 the outbreak uh, happened in, in the situation of Ramadan and Idul Fitri. Well, at the end of Ramadan, the first day after Ramadan, uh, it's, it's the holy month of, uh, of, of, of Muslim. You know, you know uh, Indonesia has a 90% uh, population of Indonesia is uh, Muslims. And then on, on the first day, uh, uh, which we call Idul Fitri, a celebration for Muslim after the holy month of Ramadan, uh, we have the, the culture. Uh, most of the people, uh, we go home to our hometown yeah, uh, like in Jakarta, yeah, uh, about uh, more than 10 million people in Jakarta. Um, majority of uh, population, uh, Jakarta's population, are actually uh, from uh, the other part of Java Island. So this will be a problem because uh, it's, it's, it makes a, a difficulty uh, for a government to, to, to apply the, something like the lockdown policy. And uh, we also have a religious pilgrimage during the Ramadan, yeah, Islamic worship, yeah, every night yeah, we have a culture to uh, pray in the mosque, masjid, yeah. And uh, we also have the uh, weekly Friday prayers, and now, uh, yeah, we have Hajj once a year, but it is already suspended by the government until next year. And other uh, worships are in other religious services. And the uh, people who uh, really uh, get the, the, the effect of the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, outbreak, uh, we can see uh, they really suffer. Uh, uh, they're like, uh, they, they come from informal economic sector and small medium enterprises like uh, traders uh, in the traditional marketplace daily labor, online transportation drivers, and etc. And in education, we also have problems, yeah, like uh, IT facilities and internet infrastructure. Yeah, uh, for uh, Sydney, maybe uh, you don't have this problem in Singapore. Uh, and then we also have a health problem, like uh, we have a low number of hospitals, doctors, nurses, uh, beds, pass equipment, uh, it's a very, very small number compared to the large number of population of Indonesia. And also about public transportation service, it's really a problem in Indonesia. And uh, also in Jakarta, we, uh, the government already improved a lot actually uh, during the last years. But still, uh, yeah, generally in Indonesia, uh, public transportation service still uh, problem. And uh, next page, please. Yeah, we also have a problem with indigenous people. Indigenous people in Indonesia are among the most vulnerable to COVID-19. Those without secure tenure, and particularly those whose lands have been seized and are forced to live as oil farmers are among the most threatened because of their simultaneous interconnections to global supply chains and lack of state health care and services. Next. Well, saving lives is the number, number one priority. Almost every country is also struggling to mitigate the social economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. National emergency response plans have forced countries to run large deficits all the whole their budget allocations. In Indonesia, the government and the parliament agreed to temporarily abandon the 3% rule of deficit to GDP ratio, but it is still not sufficient. There is also an urgent need for response at the international level. Next. And uh, during the COVID-19, uh, we uh, Indonesian government uh, has uh, produced, has issued uh, so many uh, uh, laws and regulations. Yeah. 
uh, and uh, the the very seminal uh, law that uh, has that have been produced by the government is uh, emer two I mean uh, two emergency laws yeah emergency law number one and number two of 2020 uh, number one emergency law number one uh, actually if we, uh, if we translate it uh, the emergency law in Indonesian language uh, uh, it's 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 quite long. Uh, we, we usually use uh, officially the word uh, law uh, uh, in the lieu, uh, the government regulation in the lieu of law. But uh, uh, here I will make it simple and I will uh, just say emergency law. The first one is on state financial policy and financial system stability for handling COVID-19 and or in order to face threats that harm national economy and or financial system. This emergency law has been approved by the parliament to become a law. Uh, the number is number two, 2020. Uh, this act has been controversial as even though having constituted a strong basis for the government to restore national economic stability, many constitutional lawyers, but, but many constitutional lawyers have resisted its existence as it is considered to provide impunity for the government. And the uh, second emergency law is the number two, year 2020, uh, that regulates the delay of concurrent regional head elections, which uh, should be held in September. And it has been delayed by this law, this emergency law until December, 2020. And the next page, please. And uh, besides uh, those two laws, uh, the president and national government also issued uh, government regulation, presidential decree, and presidential instructions. Yeah, uh, everything is about uh, uh, to handle the COVID-19 outbreak. Next page. And besides the president, all the ministers, not all, of course, but many, many, many ministers already also issued uh, regulations, uh, and um, ministerial regulations and uh, circulars. And I have, uh, and in the next page, I have uh, some uh, data, some list of uh, the uh, legal products of the ministers and other government's institutions. Is I go to the next page. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the writing is too small, but but this is just the list. Yeah, you can have it and see it later. Yeah, from the Ministry of Industry until the head of investment coordinating board. Yeah, all regulations. Uh, uh, the objective of uh, these regulations are all in order to uh, handle uh, the uh, COVID nineteen outbreak. And then the next page. And all, all besides the government, uh, also other state institutions also uh, issued uh, some regulations like a central bank and the financial services authority and the Supreme Court. And regional governments, of course, uh, they produce uh, uh, like gover go governatorial uh, regulations in order to uh, to handle uh, their own uh, provinces or uh, districts or regencies or municipalities. Next. Next. Uh, the, the previous one, not this one. Yeah. In handling the pandemic, the government has issued two emergency laws, as I said before. Yeah, we call it in the Indonesian language as Perpu. Name emergency law number one, 2020, for the sake of economic recovery and emergency law number two of 2020 in the field of politics. While as for handling the health sector, president did not made any emergency law. Yes, especially in health sector, president did not made any emergency law. The health sector is handled based on health quarantine law and its implementing regulations, as well as the disaster management law, which are already exist before the outbreak. 
based on the fact that the government only issued emergency law in the fields of economic and politics. In the health sector, many people considered that the government seemed not to put health aspects as the top priority in dealing with the issue of the COVID-19 pandemic outbreak. From the policies made by the government, it seems that the government has a different opinion than those people. Uh, from the regulations and policies made by the government, as if it wants to say that all the basic rules for handling health aspects in the COVID-19 pandemic already exist in the health current law that already exists before. This can be seen from the fact that in handling the health sector during this pandemic, the government only issues implementing regulations of the law. And yes, the picture that you have seen before, next page. Yeah, this is the situation in our mosques in Indonesia now. Yeah, uh, many mosques, they don't use the carpets anymore. Yeah, this is uh, uh, one of the efforts uh, where uh, the government already announced that we may uh, come to the new normal situation. So uh, people are allowed again to go to the mosque to pray but with uh, many protocols, of course, yeah, like uh, washing the hands with disinfectant, uh, liquid, like uh, uh, keeping the distance. Uh, usually it's not normal like this to, 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 to pray in, in the mosque uh, in, in Islamic uh, worships. But this is- Sorry, uh, Panav Rizal, uh, time is uh, five more minutes. Thank you. Okay, okay and the next page, uh, yeah. Uh, the COVID-19, this is uh, our website yeah, uh, to see the data, as I already mentioned the data before, next page. Uh, this is the Center for uh, and the COVID-19 for the government, uh, a special institution. It's called uh, uh, COVID-19. This is the data, next page. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, the, the, the red one. Uh, now the, the infected people and then uh, re, uh, positive and then recovery people, the blue one and then the black one is uh, the people who are dying. And then uh, the next page. Uh, yeah, uh, in, in the world we are in the number, uh, uh, our ranking is at number 32 uh, among all the state, uh, states in the world. Okay, next question. And this is the graphic still going up in Indonesia. And then, next page. Yeah, in ASEAN, uh, if you see, if you go to the uh, uh, the website of ASEAN, you can see, you can we can already see uh, many uh, ministerial meetings. Yeah, this is uh, the proposal that I want to. Uh, uh, this afternoon, yeah. Besides those meetings, yeah. yeah. Okay, as you know, has already like uh, this page. Uh, we have uh, 14, 14, I think uh, around 40 kind of ministerial meetings. Yeah, and, and four of them, I think, uh, uh, will, uh, is work, uh, working for for handling the COVID nineteen. Next page, please. Yeah, but uh, among those. Uh, 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 until now, actually, we do not have we do not, we do not, we do not yet have a permanent situation that can work stronger. I can, I can tell you what I mean as stronger later. Yeah. The proposal is to build a stronger forum uh, called Meeting of Ministers as a permanent institution that can work more closely, intensively, and can create stronger cooperation among the member states. So uh, to be short, uh, my idea is, uh, derives from the uh, condition in the situation in uh, the European Union where they have council of ministers over there as the, a permanent institution and they can produce uh, uh, soft law and hard law. Uh, but in ASEAN, I think uh, we still work uh, on the basis of the principles of ASEAN way. So, uh, to apply uh, directives, uh, yeah, theoretically it's possible, but 
um, with the situation now with the with the successful story of ASEAN way uh, we I think uh, it's not the time yet to propose a uh, directive as the as the the, the legal products to to regulate uh, all the ASEAN member states yeah so I still recommend uh, recommendation as a soft law but uh, in a, a stronger way of application and of course the this uh, new uh, institution needs um, uh, um, a special budget from all member states uh, to be collected in uh, one place in ASEAN Secretariat. Uh, we can uh, discuss about this later because uh, my time is up already. Thank you, Ari. Thank you very much, uh, partner Rizal. And indeed, uh, your proposal is quite controversial because uh, you said that ASEAN does not, does not have a permanent institution in which uh, uh, we have the Secretariat, we have the ASEAN Charter, and I think uh, it's really it's a, a strong criticism for ASEAN. Uh, I, I guess uh, what kind of cooperation that uh, you wish to propose and in what way that ASEAN can uh, have a strong voice on this one. And I think uh, maybe uh, next speaker, Professor uh, Tan Shin Li, will have another perspective on this. Uh, I guess uh, you would like to share with us, Professor Cindy. Time is yours. Thank you. Uh, you're still muted. Okay, I will uh, wait. Yeah. Okay, I'm yeah. good. Yeah. Okay. So, hello, ASEAN friends. Uh, it's my pleasure to to be here in cyberspace with all of you. Um, I learned very much from uh, Professor Novizal, and uh, it was very enlightening the data that you shared and also your perspectives on ASEAN. So today, I I want to share my own thoughts um, on ASEAN as an organization and also maybe to broaden it up to international law and international organizations and what they can do uh, for us as ASEAN people during, you know, any pandemic, not just this COVID-19, which has just wiped out our economies and, you know, um, has been very difficult for our healthcare systems. I want to point out to what Ari said earlier. He's totally right. This is a time of pandemic. You know, no matter what, we, we can prepare for them, but because it is a pandemic and, and, and COVID-19 is unprecedented, of an unprecedented scale, everyone will inevitably suffer. So what are we going to do to, to mitigate the current, um, you know, deficits, uh, the current shortfalls that we have, the, the harms that we in our societies have, have suffered, and then moving forward, how are we going to prepare ourselves to not suffer so badly in the event that something like this happens again, right? So it may not be of a pandemic scale, it could be a very bad epidemic scale, and that would be bad enough for the region as it is, you know, ASEAN as a region, we have uh, Dengue Day, which is, um, I think, a few days ago, or was it? Yeah, yeah, I think it was a few, a few days ago. So, you know, apparently, the Dengue epidemic in the region, it will be very, very bad this year. And it's forecast to be even worse for the years to come because of climate change. So let's get back to where law can help us and where international organizations such as ASEAN can help us. So um, I think one thing that that has been asked many times is that, oh, why don't international organizations help us more? Um, why doesn't international law have some sort of protective mechanism? The thing is that uh, international law, international health law has not been structured this way, right? So the WHO, the international health regulations of 2004, they are strong, but they are still soft law, right? And it also depends on how, you know, the member states who have 
have signed up to this, who have taken it on board, how they implement it within the national jurisdictions. So national jurisdictions actually have a very strong role to play in, you know, mitigating the impact of pandemics in, in public health systems, right? And also in, in the case of international organizations, you know, we are looking for assistance or, you know, emergency assistance. What are we, what Everybody wants help, but nobody has really articulated what type of help we want. Is it, is it cheaper medicines? Well, for, for, for this COVID-19, we don't have a vaccine yet, right? But we are talking about how we can make the vaccines available if a vaccine is found, right? Because it, it, from today's newspapers, it looks like it's going to be very expensive. Um, and, and, and are we looking for ventilators or are we looking for healthcare staff to be seconded to help in, in times of a pandemic? But again, we have to look back. If it's an epidemic, I think, you know, you can call on emergency resources. But when it's a pandemic that everybody is suffering terribly at the same time, it is very difficult to uh, send over resources. So, but I would like to say that ASEAN actually has, ASEAN member states have helped one another a lot not you know, in our very limited resources. Vietnam has helped Singapore, Malaysia has helped Singapore. Uh, I think Singapore has also helped a few ASEAN member states and we're all cooperating on a bilateral, multilateral basis, even if, if it's not uh, through the ASEAN organization. Of course, we are still working on, uh, through the ASEAN organization, but on the bilateral basis, there are certain uh, aid or, or help that we, we facilitate, right? So, so that's the kind of the matrix of international law and international organizations where they can help us as a region. So one thing that we I would like to point out again is that if we want, you know, our region, our ASEAN organization to put forth, you know, greater emergency responses in terms of resources, in terms of uh, equipment, so on and so forth, then now today, or, you know, yesterday, we should have been talking about how to boost our, our, our stockpiles and how do we activate these resources, you know, when the next time something like this happens. So we have to build for it and we have to remember that these things cost our governments money. So, so you know, governments and the people themselves have to agree that you know, such investments need to be made and it, this has to be made years in advance so sometimes it's not such a popular decision as well you know all these things factor into um pandemic responses so now let's go on to the next part where ASEAN has been helping uh you know, member states to facilitate uh, our pandemic, national re pandemic responses better. And um, one thing to highlight here is that the ASEAN dialogue partners have helped uh, ASEAN very much, ASEAN member states very much, especially the ASEAN plus three, China, uh, Japan and Korea, um, you know, uh, pandemic initiatives or public health initiatives, our discussions have borne fruit and, and we have learned a lot from them. So what have we what have we so far, right? So from the SARS in 2003, um, and also, you know, we, we keep having recurring avian flu, swine flu, so on and so forth. And all these pan pandemic slash epidemic responses have been discussed and activated at, you know, the ASEAN plus three discussion levels and also in, in, in terms of um, implementation within our own national policies. So, so after SARS, there were three main things that happened, which you can see that has benefited every ASEAN member state. So these three are international travel, right? So, you know, because there was a pandemic, the virus was coming in from outside within ourselves. And so, you know, governments would know when to close borders, right? Or, or when to open borders, when is it safe enough to open borders? Then information sharing, you know, this is a pandemic, COVID-19, nobody knows what it is about, but we definitely know today, June 11th, a lot more than we knew in February and March. And this is due to all the information and communication channels that have been open in within the ASEAN region and also what every ASEAN member state has been doing in terms of knowledge collection for itself, knowledge 
imparting and sharing to the other ASEAN member states. And then uh, the third one is, uh, you know, there have been uh, campaigns against disinformation. You know, now we, we see a lot of discrimination against, uh, you know, the early COVID-19 sufferers, you know, um, and against healthcare workers. So, so that has been a big part of, you know, the regional effort as well. In when I examined the discussions coming out from the ASEAN leaders' statements, um, this anti-discrimination acting against fake news, trying to quell the fears of the ASEAN people against you know this this new disease, that was one of their top priorities, just to give you know national citizens, uh, residents um, assurance. What else has there been you know going on? So. For a very long time, we also had uh, the ASEAN project on pandemic preparedness and response. So this was after SARS, and it has been in with uh, with support of the US, you know, ASEAN dialogue partner. And so what this program has done is to set basic baseline pandemic response standards for every ASEAN country according to our technical expertise and our financial resources. Right. So every country you do what is best for you, right? We're not asking you to shoot for the stars. We are asking you to do your best in every situation. And this has proved helpful. Of course, it's still not enough for any ASEAN member state because this is a pandemic, but you know, we do the best we can to save the lives of our people, right? And then there has also been called into action the ASEAN Emergency Operation Center Network and the ASEAN Bio Diaspora Regional Virtual Center which has been, which has had the help of you know, Canada, another dialogue partner. So what these operations do, these uh, bodies do, is that you get your real-time info and big data analytics on, you know, uh, people movements, um, with how how fast the disease is spreading across the world, how fast is it spreading within the ASEAN region. All these are vital information that you know ASEAN member states, the countries, our bureaucrats can work on to keep our societies safe, right? And then the last thing is that what ASEAN member states have been discussing is that um, for the future, of course, everything is still not enough, as I've always I've, I've repeated, is that, you know, we need to build forward our future alert and response capabilities, our capacities for drugs and vaccines, right? Whether or not we get a vaccine that's found, discovered in the region, or is it in Japan or in Korea or in one of our dialogue partners or, or in the EU, how are we going to develop them and, and make them available to ASEAN uh, people who, who need such vaccines to improve our public health, right? And, you know, we we can't rely on others. So we also need to rely on ourselves. We need to rely, you know, nationally and regionally. What are the mechanisms? What are the institutions? What are the programs we need to invest in to, to make ourselves stronger and to make our public health uh, responses stronger? Right. So apart from the health issue, which has been, you know, the baseline first Port of action. The second one is, and which is the the now we are really experiencing because we're in June already when the uh, when the pandemic began in January February, is the e economic impact. Yeah. So the ASEAN leaders from all the various sectors. So I have to read this out because there are quite a few, right? So apart from health, the foreign ministers. Uh, and senior officials have been meeting, you know, the working groups have been meeting, our trade and economic ministers have also been meeting, defense, because, you know, this is biohealth, so on and so forth, they're also looking at mechanisms to protect, you know, public health in ASEAN, agriculture and forestry to keep our food growing, our food being exported, our food being imported. So, you know, in Singapore, most of our food is imported, very important for me. I, would, I, I remember, you know, first two months and then buying food for my parents or my own family and so on and so forth. It was really very, very, very scary. Yeah, so thank you, you know, to everyone in the region who have kept the supply chains open. I am a beneficiary. <laughs> yeah. And and of course, you know, ASEAN, one of our main economic drivers is tourism. So so our economic ministers, our tourism ministers, our tourism agencies are on top of this, right? We cannot stop 
we cannot stop the disease from spreading so you know you know uh to to zero right but when it is safe to do so i think our our countries are looking at how to you know improve tourism for ourselves so there is domestic tourism already happening in vietnam in in, in thailand and 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 a few other asian countries um but we're also exploring the asian ministers are exploring how we can you know have this safe bubble within the region of uh, of regional tourism if we cannot open to the rest of the world so all these things are on the plate but we also need to observe the situation and and let it uh develop as as we improve the on the pandemic situation right and then something that uh professor novizal uh pointed out is that you know what you professor novizal said the small uh the micro the small enterprises so you know your one person businesses these people suffer the most and it happens in every society so it happens in singapore as well and so i think every government is looking at how to make um how help these business people make a living in very difficult times so one of the initiatives of course you know even as much as help is being given by the government or or discussed at the regional level there is going to be some sort of suffering um so but how can we prepare ourselves to 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 be more resilient economically in future so i think one way is the digitalization of business um but of course you know how it filters down it's of course no problem for mncs or medium enterprises but the small and micro that's difficult right and then then if you are senior you know you are not so tech savvy how you get uh, how you going to get onto digital platforms and certain certain industries certain businesses you just can't get onto the digital platform because that's not the type of good you're selling to the people right and or maybe your customer that's not the type of customer who buys from you so how do you how do we support them everybody deserves a, a chance at making a living you know i i totally uh, agree with this and and i support it i support you know my my neighborhood hawker because they're an elderly couple i like their food and i like them right so i make it a point to go you know i don't live so near them so i have to drive out or take a bus yeah so 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 these these things are personal these things are also at a macro governmental and regional level how do we help our people to to live better in in very very difficult times so moving forward um the asian plus 3 uh food secure uh emergency rice reserve has been very helpful you know i said uh, then uh, there's also the asian food security information system so far so good within the region we have kept you know food going we have not heard of well i mean people do suffer so but um there is no starvation crisis right things are more expensive we eat less we spend less but it is not so 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 bad right um so the last point before, as i wrap up where do we go from here so everybody has been working very hard everybody has been very very concerned about our own people or their our regional uh resilience so this is something the limitations are also um uh recognized by the asian leaders and these have been discussed at the regional level so they had a special summit and also subsequent meetings so things that that are on the plate are um because people do want you know humanitarian support emergency support in if in the event of a future pandemic so we are looking at uh, discussions are being held on how do we improve stockpiles um or even start a stockpile we are there there are talks of you know having this covid-19 asian response fund uh but currently now i think it was a one line item on the agenda that said that you know if there are excess funds you know from the regional budget these should be diverted to uh covid-19 responses so existing money seems to be you know spare existing money will be filtered there but also how do we now build our covid-19 response fund because the ramifications especially the economic ones you know and the health ones are going to be with us for at least 5 uh, years right uh, you know i'm just estimating um so 
how do we move from here? I think, you know, in the longer term, the as Ari has been uh, has said just now, regional integration, ASEAN economic integration has been on the table for a very long time since the uh, adoption of the ASEAN Charter in 2007. So we're now 2020, that's 13 years of, you know, integration. Of course, there's a political security pillar, there's a socio-cultural pillar, but uh, economic integration has been the one, you know, the priority that uh, helps to position us, all 10 ASEAN member states, as a cohesive economy so that we can produce for the region, we can trade with the uh, produce for the region, produce for the rest of the world, and also you know trade and and seek investment from outside the world. Things have been accelerating, but I think COVID nineteen you know pushes everything into this turbo speed, and we need to look at how those things can happen while we manage the impact of COVID nineteen. Yeah, so thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Shinle. Uh, indeed, uh, as an economic integration is uh, has been the main uh, focus uh, of this uh, as a community. And as you uh, rightly pointed out that, uh, uh, again, uh, the economic reason uh, could be uh, one of the main uh, issue that everybody is talking about, even though uh, the, the number of the cases is still growing, but then everybody start to think uh, about the so-called uh, losing, uh, lo uh, loosen up uh, the, 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 the limitation as well as in Indonesia, despite that the number is still growing, uh, the government uh, tried to relax uh, some, uh, some of the limitation. And this is the something that uh, we are quite uh, concerned because uh, once we are relaxing all of this limitation, sometimes that we could get the second wave of these uh, uh, new uh, uh, cases. And uh, not to mention again about the mortality. Uh, and uh, Professor uh, Shinley also mentioned about the uh, the food, sec food security, in which uh, we know that up until now we never heard, or we hope we never heard about starvation. But this is something that uh, uh, something's not impossible, right? I mean, if we if we're not doing uh, something rightly in this, uh, at least in this uh, regional uh, scheme. Um, uh, those kind of a negative impact will uh, come uh, in a very uh, short time. And I, I do like your idea of having this regional tourism. Indeed, if we cannot, uh, let's say, control the rest of the world, let's, let's control this region. I think we can uh, moving uh, or developing the, the, the economic, uh, uh, you know, uh, being developed into a, a certain level. Of course, we don't want to have a, a bigger scale of this uh, tourism, but at least just to moving a bit and a bit for the economy, just uh, to move uh, to move around, so that everybody can get uh, uh, their uh, the shares of this uh, economy uh, uh, starting. And of course, digitalization has been um, uh, started by a number of business, but again, uh, for small enterprises, I think those. Uh, those uh, uh, group uh, needs to have a, a significant support from the government and, and others uh, actors. And I think uh, for the outside partners, indeed, we still have to talk to them. Uh, I guess uh, we still have something that we need to cooperate uh, in under some issues. Um, thank you very much, uh, Shinli, for your insights and your shares. And now we're moving on to uh, uh, our colleague from uh, Thailand, uh, Professor Ponchai. Uh, I, I guess you would like to share your uh, experience in Thailand. Time is yours. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Can you hear me now? Yes. That's good. Thank you. Let me. Oh, you share. You can share my slide. Okay. I don't have to share my slide on the Zoom. Thank, uh, first of all, thank you very much from the University Staff Indonesia and the Faculty of Law that in, inviting me to come to these panels and then get to talk with you about the, how we cope with the uh, COVID crisis by the legal frameworks. Most of the slide of my uh, presentation is about how we can implement in Thailand about the legal frameworks that we use dealing with the COVID crisis. And I, 
at the last slide, I will talk about further cooperation about ASEAN cooperation, how we can deal with the uh, crisis in this time. Can you please go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, this is the outline of my presentation. I will be quick, so you can ask a question later. Um, the first thing that Thailand implements on law is about we use the emergency decree on public administration. Um, it's the main laws that the government can implement or enforce during the emergency crisis. So this COVID crisis, we consider as a very big crisis So the government use this act to give the power to the prime minister to issue the regulation to control everything. And the other law is about communicable disease acts, which apply to about um, sanitary health uh, situation. So this is two main law that Thailand used to, to tackle with the COVID crisis. And also um, we have the ad hoc center. Cent this center just established, I mean, only five months ago about to dealing with the crisis. The center uh, the main ad hoc committee controlling every policy regarding to the COVID crisis. So these three, three, I mean, three main thing that Thailand employ as a legal framework and institutional framework as to deal with the COVID crisis. Let's, I, let, can you please move to the next slide? I will, I will go quick on the, and then you can list on, on detail later. Um, let, let, let's take the example on the section 11 of the emergency decree on public administration. Um, this section give a lot of power to the prime minister to tackle all any um, emergency crisis, including healthcare crisis or whatsoever. So according to the section 11, um, the prime minister has the power to issue a no notification. In Thailand notifications, we consider as the subordinate laws by the, the big the acts which is the degree is the bigger, I mean, the umbrella of the X power for the government. Then the prime minister can use notification as the recreation under, the, the act, the, under the, that decree. So if you move a little bit to the other slides, you see that, can you please move on to the other slide? If you see that, I mean, in the section 11, you see so many um, powers for the prime minister to issue any laws govern to dealing with the case of the COVID crisis and the other crisis that happen in Thailand. Please move to the next slide, please. Can you follow? Next, please, yeah. Next, please. Yeah, so for example, in the, I mean, in the section 11, nine, the, the, the prime minister can issue notification that about the purchase, sale, or use of possession of arms or goods of also medical products or consumers' products. So they can the government by this emergency decree. Once it's announced, prime ministers take part as the I'm, I'm don't, I normally don't use this word, this word, but as the dictatorship of power to control everything as to deal with the power, as to deal with the crisis. So. Um, so this is the main law, and then they govern everything. The gov normally, in this case, the prime minister we have a lot of committee helping him to decide what to do and not to do. So by this law, is the main important legal mechanism for Thailand to deal with this problem, and a lot of issue has been, I mean, tackled by the subordinate declaration that I mentioned before, according to the section eleven. Can you move forward to the next slide, please? So this is the example of the recreation or notification which the, the prime minister, you see on the picture on the, that the prime minister with the mask, he issues so many, I mean, mechanism, measure according to the, his power by the decree. For example, giving the power to each provincial mayor to control and manage the association. In Thailand, they have 76 provinces plus Bangkok, which is, um, they have to manage by themselves according to this, this recreation. So it is kind of like centralized, but decentralized control in Thailand. So this is, I think one thing is good is because 
the prime minister can issue any regulation and then ask all the mayor to control by themselves. So at least each province know the way to control. And then this is the important move from only between only four months that the Thailand at least can control the crisis. And then another one is about the curfews. So no people can, um, no people can go out from the house. I mean, leaving in, in the nighttime from 10 p.m. until 4 a.m. The, the main point of this curfew is to making sure there's no pubs, no um, entertainment at the nighttime, and to make sure that people will not travel because it, at the nighttime we cannot control anything. Then the government said, okay, it should be a curfew and from 10 p.m. until 4 a.m. in the morning. Another one is about re restriction on the alcohol sale and consumption. The main issue because Thailand tend to consume a lot of alcohols and they want to entertain a lot by the alcohol. Then the government said, okay, it's not the time for drinking. It should be the stop time. Then the government said, okay, no sale of alcohol. However, just the end of last month, they just issued a new regulation that permit the sale of alcohol now because the situation is getting much better. Um, the other one is about lockdown in specific areas. If there is any issue in any specific areas, government will issue any regulation to lockdowns in the areas. And also, we ban the travel from OOC plus travel bans from provinces in Thailand. For example, I am in Chiang Mai. If I have to go outside last month, if I have to go outside my province, I have to be quarantined, self-quarantined for 15 months, and I have to be registered with the another provinces mayor procedures. So this is kind of the, 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 the control not to travel and have to stay at home with the policy that stay home place save the other people. Also, they close all the potential business, for example, haircuts, hairdressing, and so on. Every business that may create a spreading of the the disease, the government say that no, shutting down. They just start to open the business. I think some business, only some business um, last month. So this is kind of control that in Thailand they use this law and regulation in order to control that. Um, and also no congregation, no, no congregation between the people. Um, if people coming together more than five, it's may consider as the spread of the COVID crisis, uh, COVID-19, then the government said that should, during past two months, you know, people, there shouldn't be any ceremony. If, if needed, there shouldn't be ceremony or any kind of like ceremony that congregate people all together. However, the exemption, like for example, like um, important ceremony that, that can be, but they have to have the distance between the people. So this is the example of the um, recreation that Thailand has been in place. Um, they hope, according to the, my source, because I did, as a dean, I have to close faculty during two months as well. Um, I talked with the university, yet yeah, they said that, I think on 23 of June, the 23rd of June, Thailand will be open again, because I think now only one last case in Narativa. Then we hopefully that we can go open Thailand again. Please go to the next slide, please. And I might go too quick. No, okay. This is the example of the curfew um, that the police militarily come forward and then control everything during the nighttime. And they use the section 18. And if any people um, infringe the, the regulation, they will have to be um, the two years of imprisonment or and um, the fine of 1,000 baht, 40,000 baht for the um, breach or, I mean, infringement of the emergency regulation. Okay. Please go forward for the other X. I will wait. Okay. And this is another legal mechanism. Um, mainly before we, before government decide to use the emergency decree, the government said that, okay, we can use the communicable disease acts first. However, by only purely the communicable disease acts is not controllable to be linked with the crisis for the COVID crisis. Then the government used the decree. Um, in Thailand, so let me put in the 
easier picture. The, the emergency decree is the bigger. I mean, it's the same level of the law, but the power of the prime minister is bigger than um, in this crisis. So they normally use the emergency decree plus the communicable disease acts. Um, the communicable D disease acts mainly dealing with any control for disease that can spread. Most of the case that is the committee of the communicable disease will give the power to the provincial mayor. So at this point, you see that com, uh, provincial mayor has two power from the emergency, emergency decree plus the communicable disease act. Um, so every province has to control by themselves, but under the central policy of that two legal mechanism. Yeah. Can you go first to the other slide, please? So for example, in, I mean, I'll show you from section 20, um, provincial committee, communicable disease committee. You see on the picture on the right hand side, this is the picture from the Chiang Mai mayor. He is the one up by the communicable disease acts. The one who issued any declaration to control within the areas of province. So most of the case, they follow the policy from the central government that to issue closing down the business or whatsoever. So I think by these two legal mechanisms, it is helping Thailand to deal with the COVID crisis. I think for me, for me, it's effective enough to deal with this chart situation. Um, however, we still some got some cases because of now there's some um, foreign, I mean, some people coming back from, from, from countries outside Thailand, then they have to be under the quarantine. Can you please go to the other slide? Another slide, please. Then you see, this is the picture of Thailand, 776 provinces plus Bangkok. All together, they have to manage by themselves, but under, only, under two legal mechanisms. Then the prime minister can at least check with the provincial mayor how that each, um, each province deal with the COVID crisis and combine all together, then become the central policy of Thailand. I think for me, in the past, Thailand government in the center tend to be very slow in dealing with something, but this, in this crisis, they're very fast in issuing and deploying the power to the mayor. And they're dealing a lot of problem in each provinces. Um, the lucky thing is I will show you later is about the, the committee the center committee for dealing with this COVID crisis. Please go. If okay, if according to the communicable disease, the people who breach this communicable disease, they will have at least um, one month imprisonment or at least um, five of not exceeding ten thousand baht Thai baht. So this is kind of criminalization if any person breach the law or I mean infringe the law in Thailand. Sorry Can for time. Five more minutes. Okay, I'll go quick. Can you go to the other slide, please? Yeah, this is the center. So I'll go quick. This center plus the two legal frameworks become the main, the main action for Thai governments. The center will pronounce every day how many people has been contracted with the COVID crisis, how many people travel from OC and contracted, how many people quarantined, and all the Thai people will watch the TV at 12 o'clock at the Thai time. Then people know what is the situation. Um, I think the good thing is because this center in, I mean, in January, there are normally the committee are from the politician. However, in February, they change to all the med medical doctors. So it's easier to have the recommendation from the medical doctors to deal with the disease. So all in all, I think the government in Thailand used two legal mechanisms, plus the institution a agency, which is, I think, effective enough to deal. However, there is criticism about um, the government, this concern about the poor people because their lack of, the government just pronounced that everyone has to close out, stop all the business, stop all the activities and stay at home. However, the poor people cannot stay at home. They have to live, I mean, working all every day they can earn and they can eat from that earning. So that's the point. I mean, I think after this control of the COVID, I think after 
the end of this month, the government has to resume the economic system. So this is another task. The COVID crisis will not kill the people of Thailand this time, but the economic crisis may next time, according to the, my, my research. Okay, can you move, move to the next slide, please? Okay, one more minute. Um, according to my research, because I normally research on CLMB, which is Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, and Thailand, um, I, I have seen that it should be, uh, there is the contact between the countries. The borders cannot easily close. There, I think what I suggest is that there should be a harmonization of the regulation for travel. For example, ASEAN country have to harmonize the rules about the quarantines, about the regulation that the people can cross the border or can come over within the ASEAN. Um, I essentially, I mean, we are now in my faculty and the other faculties in my UC, we are now talking to propose the policy about the bubble cooperation. The bubble cooperation is mean that the countries that can control the COVID should be bubble with the other country that can control the COVID. I think within my back, I mean, ideas, I think ASEAN countries like Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, and the other country can control the COVID. So we should become a bubble and then we can harmonize the regulation all together as to make sure that the, as a, at least essential travels can travel cross border in ASEAN countries. And also there should be a regional framework for communicable disease. Um, I think it's the important point of the COVID-19 is that we, we know that the, the crisis of the health is not only one country, it's spread all the world. In ASEAN, in Thailand, we seem to have a lot of influence. I mean, the contract patching from Myanmar, from Laos as well. So this is a good point for us to talk and manage all together in ASEAN. Um, if from the last point, I think that ASEAN plus should be another story. After we can have the bubble in ASEAN, we choose plus six because if you can see Japan, Korean, China, um, Australia, New Zealand, and so in six countries, I mean, past six, it's become, I think, according to my research, they are, they can be bubble because they can control the crisis in the effective way. So this is my um, slides and you can talk with me later if you have any question. Sorry for taking so long. That's all right. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Pornchai. And indeed your proposal is very interesting uh, in regards with the quarantine uh, borders areas and also the frameworks cooperation, not only for this uh, COVID-19, but also for the future. I guess this is uh, the ones that we have anticipation uh, in which uh, we have a previous pandemic and now we're having and now we're going to have it maybe in the next decades or something. And also about the co-management of the disease, maybe you can uh, explain a bit later on. But uh, as the last uh, speakers, we, I would like to give the opportunity to uh, Professor uh, Tan Pe Dung, uh, I hope uh, your connection is stable now and then you can talk uh, 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 very clearly. Zoom, time is yours. Uh, can the committee unmute the speaker, please? Yes. Hello. Yes. Hello. Uh... Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, uh, pay my uh, 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 thank, uh, say thank you for organizing this uh, event, and uh, I am very honored to uh, present uh, some uh, uh, my, of my thoughts about the the, the fight of uh, ASEAN and Vietnam uh, against the the COVID nineteen. So uh, I I would at at the beginning of my presentation I will. Uh, yeah, give us uh, some of the share some of experience that we have in Vietnam, and after that, I will I would like also to discuss about the, the some some of the issues that uh, the previous pre presenter have uh, discussed. Next, please. Uh, okay, next, please. So I I think uh, I think the um, one of the very important uh, uh, factor that uh, COVID uh, nineteen has caused to uh, our uh, society, uh, our international society, and any region is the spread of uh, the virus is an unexpected uh, spread, and uh, I think that uh, Vietnam is uh, among the, the 
those countries who have very uh, very well uh, very uh, appropriate uh, policy to uh, fight against the the the, uh, the coronavirus. And I would like to just to in this uh, first part of my presentation, I just want to share uh, experience of, of Vietnam uh, against this uh, uh, the epidemic. Uh, first of all, I I, uh, I think the one very important uh, thing that uh, I, I would like to note about our experience is the, the approach of Vietnamese government uh, towards this uh, disease. Uh, actually, when uh, when we have, uh, have heard about the, uh, I mean, have some information about the uh, uh, coronavirus, the well, it was sometime in uh, the end of January. So um, and uh, at, at that uh, and uh, right at the time when we uh, uh, when the government not about the not got, got to know about the the, the the virus the the Vietnam have start already prepared for uh, decided to uh, to make a very uh, 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 urgent action plans against this uh, spread of disease and uh, at that time the um, the uh, the government have ordered the ministries and relevant agencies. To carry out the uh, the measures to prevent the, the new virus from the spreading in, into the country, so it, uh, back to uh, end of the January, it was like sometime in uh, 17 or, uh, or 16, uh, 16, 17 January before, right before the new year, uh, we had uh, got some information about the virus and uh, there are two cases uh, of um, infected uh, uh, infected of uh, the virus in in Vietnam. And, and at that time, the the government had uh, immediately ordered the, the 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 relevant ministries and agencies to uh, to uh, to strengthen the uh, the the medical quarantine uh, at the border gates, at, at the airport, at the, at the seaport. And we had, uh, after a week from uh, from the the, the news. We had uh, closed down the the border with China. Soon? So uh, it was actually very hard yeah. move because uh, uh, the, uh, the government Vietnam uh, understand uh, the, the trade with China was is important, but um, Vietnam has a little, very limited resource to uh, the medical resource to uh, find again the the the, the epidemia if it happens. If it is to uh, Try to uh, uh, preserve the, the the society from the, the spread of virus, and uh, so uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Hello. I just have a good, good. Yes, good. Connect. Continue, please. So, <laughs> hello. So, can you hear me? Um, Hello. So, Hello? yes, Hello? yes, yes. I can hear you now. Maybe it's better for your uh, video is off. Zoom. Hello, Zoom. Zoom. <laughs> um. Hello, Zoom. Uh, I think he's uh, logged off. I guess um, this is one of the, <laughs> the the new normal that we're having right now. You know, having a seminar with uh, difficulties of uh, technical uh, difficulties. Uh, I guess uh, while we're waiting for the, uh, Zoom, um, oh no, he's uh, joining us again. Just uh, uh, please be patient. I think he's already on. And Zoom, can you hear me? Hello, Zoom. Zoom. Yes. Yes. So, Continue, please. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, right. So I'm I'm sorry, but I don't know what happened to the with the internet connections. It. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So. I, I I just want to say that uh, the the Vietnam has uh, taken very. Uh, 
precautious approach towards the uh, epidemia, uh, given that uh, we have a past experience with the uh, bird flu and the SARS. So they, 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 uh, the government had uh, ordered the government, the prime minister have ordered the ministries to uh, to take the actions uh, and establish a task force to uh, to re uh, direct again the risk of disease spreading right uh, at the beginning when we have the very 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 uh, the first news about the disease and uh, we also communicate very closely with the world health organizations to uh, to um, follow their instructions and um, but um, so uh, next please next slide please Okay, so uh, at the phase one of the, and actually I would like to, uh, I mean, for in, uh, to uh, share, split the phase, uh, three phases for, for our uh, re uh, reaction against the COVID-19. The first one is when we have, uh, uh, is, uh, when you say split the first six cases of the uh, COVID and um, uh, Vietnam, when in the first of February, yeah, in Vietnam has, uh, government have, uh, what they knew about the six first case, it already it has uh, immediately uh, de 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 declare the at that time we called the NCOVID as the national epidemic and uh, announced a number of uh, preventive measures, including uh, uh, compulsory checkups uh, and um, and treatment for those who have infected with the virus and and on on the uh, uh, free basis. So that everyone can, could come and, and do the medical checking, uh, also do the medical is isolation for people infected by the virus, uh, improving the sanitations and uh, starting to educate people about the, the individual protections. And um, uh, the, we also start to develop the few hospitals in the area that have the high risk of uh, disease spreading. At that time, it was at the border with China and in the tourist uh, area where we had a lot of uh, tourists uh, from from China, and uh, as, at, at, as, at the same time, we work very closely with our international partners and uh, to uh, exchange information about the, uh, the about the disease. We work very closely with the uh, uh, WHO and also shared information, receiving information from uh, all uh, international partners in in ASEAN, in Europe. U.S. and uh, China. Uh, next, please. So, uh, I think uh, and uh, at it, uh, and, and uh, Vietnamese and the Vietnamese uh, government has uh, taken uh, slowly after after the the uh, after the first weeks of uh, February, it start to apply the various uh, precautionary measures to respond with the COVID outbreak. And um, the, the and we actually, at that time we, we already realized that if the the disease uh, have uh, taken place, uh, a lot of uh, business and uh, and uh, in Vietnam will be affected, uh, and therefore the uh, the government have introduced uh, immediately the 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 order that yeah, we call Directive Eleven to uh, setting the measure to help the to help uh, to address the difficulties faced by the business community. And um, uh, so uh, this was uh, uh, it considered as very important move to help the small and medium sized enterprise to overcome the crisis because uh, the, our economy is actually based on the small and medium sized uh, business mostly. So um, I, and up, uh, next slide, I will share with you some uh, important move uh, that uh, Vietnam has uh, taken uh, in accordance with the Directive uh, 11. Next slide, please. Right, so uh, we had uh, first thing uh, and very important, the government has ordered the state bank to request the other banks in Vietnam to simplify the, the administrative uh, procedure, shorten the, shorten the time for loan approval or increase the accessibility for the bank loans. So basically the, it will help to uh, the small and medium sized uh, enterprise and individual to get the loans for, for uh, purpose of uh, maintaining their business during the, the disease. And the Ministry of, uh, Foreign, uh, of Finance also have to uh, 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 regulate to the 
uh, deferral the deadline of the for payment of tax and land uh, rental fee uh, and it will apply to those who are uh, affected by the virus the the, the, the outbreak and um, it also uh, uh, apply the you know the policy special policy to support the medium and, and sm small and medium size uh, enterprise in terms of the income tax and uh, they, they also uh, uh, expand the, the deadline for uh, payment of tax, uh, postpone the collection of social insurance, and uh, and and the uh, payment of the uh, trade union contributions. It, it, and now, uh, and uh, more importantly, the Ministry of Transport was ordered to uh, to uh, reform the administration procedure to reduce the logistics and the transportation costs, so the people can can uh, travel back to their to their uh, hometown and uh, do not concentrate in the city. So uh, that what uh, and uh, next slide, please. Uh, for next slide, please look and no, sorry, this this one is right. The no, come back to the yes, yes, thank you. And uh, the local authorities was ordered to uh, reduce the charge and fee uh, for the uh, those affected by the COVID-19 outbreak and not increase the, the price for the first and second quarter of uh, the, uh, 20, uh, 2020 for the goods and, um, and the Ministry of uh, Industry and Trade and must ensure that all the raw materials and manufacturing uh, sh sh shall we maintain in the uh, in, uh, in in the right order, and um, the uh, the the M the MOIT also have to uh, organize the production and distribution supply of goods, so uh, the, uh, so the people can be ensured with, uh, that they don't face the shortage of food, because uh, at that time in Europe in some countries there was a uh, uh, in a very uh, big shortage of food at the supermarket. So uh, the, the Ministry of uh, Industry and Trade in Vietnam was uh, have a special task to maintain the, the supply of food. And uh, they must uh, consolidate all domestic market and support the retail trading activities so that the, 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 the people will be ensured with the, with the food supply. And uh, yeah, the... The, the MOIT and the MOF also have to facilitate it with the custom clearance and address the difficulty faced with the important exporters. Uh, next, please. So uh, it is it was the, the, the phase uh, one of the of the, of the COVID nineteen, but and at, at towards the end of uh, February, uh, so we were meant we were able to maintain the the. Uh, the Number of these uh, of, uh, affected people only uh, only sixteen cases. Yeah. Well, at that time in the world already some country like Italy, and already uh, like few uh, few thousand. And uh, but at and then but and by the sixth of March, yeah, of uh, of uh, uh, Vietnam has no, uh, confirmed the the seventeenth case. We, who who there was the person who returned from Europe. So the then and the, at that time the government has uh, understood that uh, the the the, the severity, severity of the COVID uh, uh, outbreak and uh, they uh, they they have uh, they have uh, ordered to uh, to, uh, to uh, the, the the ministry to enter the second phase. They have to prepare more stringent measures to uh, protect and uh, to pre prevent the the COVID uh, outbreak. And uh, sec, oh, uh, next, please. Uh, so uh, the, um, the 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 government have uh, made a very strong propaganda campaign uh, against the COVID nineteen, educating peoples to uh, to uh, uh, you know to uh, towards the Vietnam approach uh, again the COVID, and uh, the one I think very important thing they did is to uh, to open the to launch the health declaration uh, on the mobile applications. Yeah, so make sure that all Vietnamese uh, who are using the smartphone can uh, understand uh, and can uh, got to know about the, the actual situations. And also they will know where is the, uh, you know, the, the area with affected people. They also can inform the government authorities about the, the, the suspicious people who, who got the, 
the, the you know the, the COVID, and it helped to the government to control the the spread of the COVID in the society. Yeah, and uh, so everyone now, even myself, yeah, I, I myself, I also have this uh, application on my uh, on my on my on my uh, handphone. Yeah, every every day I would use this and inform about my health conditions, uh, and uh, also not got to know about whether around me is there anybody who got is infected by uh, the virus, or yeah, or, or have a relative who uh, got infected by the virus. I think this uh, this is very important for the government to control the the situation. Okay, uh, next please. So uh, and uh, but then the, the after the, the people returning from uh, from the, from uh, Europe, then uh, the, the the spread of, of uh, coronavirus uh, has uh, increased. Within a month, we have uh, you know uh, got two hundred cases, and everyone understand that if the and that they need to do uh, more stringent uh, actions, more robust action to uh, to uh, uh, to fight against the, the virus. So the uh, the government have uh, decided to lock down the the, um, the cities Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City, and uh, they uh, all this or uh, and um, uh, they uh, they wear, they request all the people to wear the mask when they go out from the from the street throughout the street is compulsory, and uh, all the uh, all the uh, uh, gathering more than fifty and later ten people are prohibited on the street. And uh, by by and uh, oh, by doing so, the um, I think that the, the spread of uh, COVID has been uh, 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 stopped in uh, in uh, in Viet in Vietnam. And uh, and uh, next please. And uh, I think and it on by the end of uh, April. By the end of April, Vietnam has announced that they abolished the lockdown policy. So uh, basically. Uh, Vietnam now already uh, the life become back to normal, uh, except the fact that we don't have the have not opened the air uh, the, the the air flights to other country, but um, within the country uh, the life already uh, back to normal. Uh, you, you can see the pictures I have taken yesterday, yeah, on the on my slides that uh, people already went to the to the mall and went on the street a lot of motorcycles, yeah, and um, uh, and. Uh, Today, uh, as of today, there are uh, from Jan January to uh, towards uh, uh, 11th of June, we have only 332 cases, no death case, and uh, 220 people got uh, recovered from the uh, the virus. Uh, yeah. So uh, this is uh, about the, the the next next slide, please. I think that overall there are many uh, lessons that could be learned from uh, from our, uh, the Vietnam approach. The uh, the first one is that we uh, we uh, because we have a very limited uh, we real realize that our, we have very limited resource medical resources, hospitals, to uh, so we are not we are not able to uh, we will not be we will not be able to uh, control uh, the, the the outbreak of the the the, the COVID if we, and therefore we do the 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 first the restricting the movement. From, from very beginning, and uh, and we we realized the government have realized uh, immediately that if we stop the the movement of goods and uh, transportation and and uh, individual, they, they, it will affect the economy. Uh, however, it, it this move is uh, considered more balanced to uh, overcome the to, to, uh, the, 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 the 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 causes of the disease. The second very important thing is the Vietnamese has been able to uh, Vietnamese government has been able to mobilize the nationalism and uh, amongst the the, the the people, and uh, so that they they cooperate with the government to fight the uh, the virus. Yeah, the propaganda by the government that uh, you know fighting against uh, virus like fighting uh, in the war. It, it I think this this slogan have. Uh, uh, Unify the people and uh, make them, them to uh, cooperate with the with the government very uh, uh, efficiently. And um, uh, the and other the and the third is the I think very uh, important exist, uh, experience of Vietnam is the, the active uh, cooperation with international uh, 
organization in international uh, uh, partners. Yeah, I think uh, this is uh, some somewhat very uh, uh, nutshell about the Vietnam experience to fight against the COVID. And uh, regarding the regional uh, cooperation, I think uh, what Vietnam have done can be a model for countries in uh, in ASEAN to uh, to uh, understand to approach the the similar. Uh, I think that uh, when we when uh, when we uh, uh, facing this problem, uh, one of the very important uh, decision we must make is uh, about the economic economic uh, benefits and uh, and uh, of, of the of the, the uh, measure. Uh, uh, of course, the uh, and um, I think that uh, the exchange of information and exchange of experience between the ASEAN countries are very important. And uh, I think that uh, Vietnam, as a, as a chair of ASEAN in 2020 uh, has uh, in the year 2020, has uh, has shown a good case for the for the other country to uh, cooperate and to uh, the, the method to uh, fight against the the similar uh, disease if it happen in the future. Yeah. So, and um, at, another thing is uh, with the with from the economic perspective, I think that the uh, Vietnam shown shown that uh, the, it it overcome the, the the situation fast, and now the investment many investment has come back to uh, come to Vietnam, and uh, and if you look we look at the broader picture the 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 chain the the switch of the supply chain from out of China due to this uh, disease, I think that ASEAN can uh, in my opinion can be a, 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 a can be a, a, a destination for the investment from. Uh, from, uh, from uh, around the world, if we can uh, can keep the the stability, uh, we can uh, further improve the economic uh, the the, uh, the the ASEAN economic community. I mean the single market. It uh, it and also we can um, uh, show to the world that we are cooperative and transparent, and also it can improve the 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 roadmap that we have made in the ASEAN. Uh, uh, ASEAN, um, uh, uh, you know, roadmap. Then, I think that the uh, ASEAN can uh, can be a very uh, can have a very good chance to develop in the, in the near future. And uh, yeah, this is the, some of my thoughts about the the problems of COVID and the possibility for ASEAN to uh, uh, for development in the in the future. I think uh, yeah. So uh, uh, I I think maybe for other issue we could uh, discuss with uh, other. Uh, uh, speakers. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Zung. And indeed, uh, is very happy to hear that uh, the the lift of the limitation of uh, the social activity in Vietnam, and hopefully, uh, it will be happening all over uh, the place in 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 ASEAN. And beside in here, we also have uh, the the news that uh, New Zealand also one of the place that uh, already. Uh, what do you call it, have a, a normal, real normal activity, but not uh, opening its uh, border yet, okay. Uh, the time uh, has a 10 to two, but I would like, uh, sorry, a three, uh, 10 to three, but I would like to uh, ask uh, the leniency of the speakers to hold uh, your time a little bit, just for another 15 minutes until 3.15. So I would like to uh, read the questions uh, from the participants First uh, is to uh, Mr. Nofrizal. Um, uh, there's a question in regards with our uh, uh, government's uh, regulation about the uh, the perpu uh, that many uh, many uh, many uh, people or groups uh, suggest that this perpu is have a potential to. Um, what to call it, uh, to violate uh, our constitution. What is your uh, opinion on that? And um, I think uh, a question for uh, Shin Lee. Uh, there's, uh, the first questions come from Hannah. Uh, she asks uh, about, since the base of ASEAN cooperation is about centrality, how far and how effective ASEAN legal cooperation will work in national level of each country? That's the first question. Second question coming from Jerry from Plita Harapan University. I don't know, maybe you've, you've met her. Uh, 
some countries enacted some policies in regards with export restriction, especially on food supply. What can be done to this issue from ASEAN perspectives? And, um, and the third uh, uh, question coming from Prilly, uh, tourism took a huge blow. Uh, I mean, the epidemic uh, has a huge blow to tourism. How do we know, how do we as ASEAN countries deal with people movements in the future, whether it's a short or a long term with this new normal uh, situation? And as for uh, Professor Pornchai, uh, there's a question from Yarit. For the Thai government and for this uh, existing regulation regarding with COVID-19, uh, which one is the, pr uh, pr uh, the priority? Is it the economy or the health issue? Um, I guess uh, for uh, Zoom, um, yeah, I think this is kind of a general uh, question. Uh, I think everybody can answer this one as well. So um, how uh, we can deal with the small enterprises with the situation of the COVID-19? Um, and also for the, the all participants, uh, there's a question. Uh, ASEAN as organization seems powerless in this pandemic. Do you think that this is the time to amend institutional institutional setting to be more effective? Okay, I guess uh, the last two question is for uh, all the speakers. So first, I would like to give the opportunity for Pan of Rizal to uh, answer the question. Pan of Rizal. Yeah. So the question is about uh, the the government regulation that uh, have a potential in violation of our constitution. But okay, yeah, uh, this uh, yeah, I think uh, the, the 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 protest from the people, from the uh, legal expert, from from the constitutional law expert. I think uh, for me, uh, in my opinion, it's very reasonable because uh, in this. Uh, uh, emergency law saying that uh, the, uh, the, the, the this emergency law gives uh, an impunity to uh, the government uh, in order to uh, to act uh, in order to to, to recover the, the the financial problem the the economic problem uh, by saying that uh, the government cannot be sued. Uh, uh, if they uh, if they do it in a, in a good intention, so the, that's that's the word in, in, in the in the emergency law saying that. Uh, but I think uh, these uh, words uh, it's not necessary to put in the law because uh, without that words, uh, if you do everything uh, as a government, of course. Uh, you do it with uh, with good intention, so you don't need this, uh, to, to put these words in, in the law. So if you do it in uh, not in a good intention or by infringing other laws or uh, in a bad uh, uh, intention, then of course uh, the, the 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 I mean only only the only the, the the court can can say that you are wrong or you are right so uh, we cannot say that we cannot be sued because uh, we do it in a good intention and then we cannot uh, be brought to uh, the court so it's 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 infringing the the article uh, 27 of the constitution uh, Paragraph one saying that all citizens shall be equal before the law and the government shall be required to respect the law and the government with no exception. So that's why uh, legal experts say this uh, 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 emergency law uh, breach uh, the constitution. And that's the, uh, my uh, yes. explanation for this question. Yes, and another question, Pan of Rizal, uh, in regarding with your proposal of these meetings of ministers, 
Does it make any difference yeah. with regular ASEAN meetings? Yeah, uh, regular meetings now. Uh, actually, I, I, I originally I want to 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 propose a, really a council, but the the council in uh, the, the the council of ministers in the European Union, it's really permanent body, and uh, uh, the nature is supranational. So it's not possible to establish this kind of institution in the body of ASEAN, yeah, because ASEAN itself is not a supranational organization. The, the, the principle of uh, ASEAN is uh, we still use uh, intergovernmental cooperation as the basis of uh, the work of ASEAN. So uh, for me, uh, in my proposal, actually, I. I, I simply said uh, the, 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 the agreement, uh, the international agreement among the member states of the ASEAN countries within this uh, new uh, um, forum of uh, ministers meeting, uh, you know, in the meeting, uh, they produced uh, uh, an agreement, right? And, uh, this agreement should be uh, obeyed by all the uh, participants, by all the member states. Uh, so in soft law, there is no sanction. There is no uh, police or, or uh, there is no court to, 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 to give you a uh, sentence uh, if you breach the law. So intergovernmental cooperation uh, really, really, uh, um, made a, a soft law. I mean, yeah, the, the, the products, are the, the legal products of the intergovernmental cooperation and the basis of intergovernmental cooperation uh, is a soft law. So uh, in the European Union, especially in the body of uh, uh, the Council of Ministers, they produce uh, two kinds of law. Yeah? Uh, one is uh, regulations and directives. Uh, which they uh, do it together with the European Parliament, and they also can produce recommendation. So recommendation produced by the Council of Ministers in the European Union, in the, uh, by the, con the Council of Ministers in the European Union, uh, they really respect uh, uh, this uh, kind of recommendation. So, and in, in, in ASEAN now, we already have the, uh, some meetings yeah, uh, from, the, from the ministers, but, but this kind of forum is not a, 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 an institution yet. It's, it's just a forum, it's just forums. Uh, there is no secretariat for this. Uh, the, there's no leadership in this uh, forum. Uh, uh, so uh, after they made their, uh, the agreement and then uh, still depends on the country how they each country, each, each member country, how uh, they want to apply uh, this kind of agreement. But in my proposal, with uh, this kind of new uh, ministers meeting as uh, uh, as a uh, yeah semi uh, supranational body, uh, after they make an agreement, uh, yeah. Uh, this agreement, they, they, they will call it as community recommendation, but they have to control it uh, regularly, uh, like every two months, uh, whether uh, the country who, uh, uh, which got the recommendation, or maybe the recommendation is for all the countries, member countries. So uh, they, uh, between this, among these member states, uh, they uh, shall have uh, evaluation uh, regularly, and then uh, they will talk, they will discuss what's the obstacles, um, why you cannot apply this recommendation. So, so on the basis of close, very close, very intensive uh, cooperation. So okay. this is the difference between uh, my new proposal and the existing uh, minister's meeting. I think okay. uh, obviously. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Pak Novrizal, for your explanation and your uh, further clarification on these uh, uh, proposing uh, some kind of a solution. Uh, next, uh, Shunli. Sorry. Yeah. 
Okay, great. So yeah, just to go through the three main questions and I think the roundup of the last two questions. So, you know, on uh, to Hannah's question on centrality, how far, how effective, um, you know, I think it would really depend because ASEAN, our 10 jurisdictions are very, and, and 10 economies are very diverse, right? Um, I think we have come a long way, but you know, there is a lot more to do across the three pillars. If you're talking about public health pandemic uh, um, specifically, you know, um, I think if you want to read the special summit, um, uh, the conclusions of the special summit of leaders, of the ASEAN leaders, you know, there is a whole long list of things that they, the leaders want to do as a region for their for our countries, our 10 countries. So, you know, there, there is some way for us to go to strengthen our public health pandemic uh, effectiveness and reactions. Um, one thing I want to stress is that, you know, this is international law, right? And then we also talk, there's also national law, but then as lawyers, I think we cannot be in this silo where law is the only effective thing because there is a lot of cross-disciplinary, you know, uh, expertise involved. You know, your uh, your economists need to to be involved. You, your governance uh, policies, all these sectors also need to be involved at the national level to make. Um, regional policies work, right? Whether it's a hard law like an ASEAN uh, trade uh, treaty to make it work at the national level or, or you know, a public health um, uh, declaration or agree uh, or work, work plan to make it work at the national level. So one thing that I want to point out is that, you know, just now I mentioned that the, uh, there was this program that, uh, yeah, the ASEAN project on pandemic preparedness, the, the one that USAID uh, supported and, and that helped to give baseline um, uh, precautions and protocols for for the ASEAN member states to have in accordance with their resources and their technical expertise, so on and so forth, there was a monitoring and implementation mechanism. And so they actually checked one year later to see, oh, are you, are you prepared up to that minimum level? And also something that came out of the ASEAN Special Summit of Leaders was that, you know, all the leaders recognized that although we have this World Health Organization, you know, uh, regulations, the 2004 regulations, all the ASEAN member states still need to implement these, you know, international soft laws, not just the ASEAN soft laws, well. So, so there is an implementation problem, not, you know, um, a making of law problem in ASEAN or perhaps in the international law world. You know, we want to see things in effect. So I think we have made the infrastructure, we have made the laws, we have made the policies. Let's uh, work on them as best as we can, you know, within our finite time and resources, right? Regarding uh, Jerry's point regard, uh, on, on, on food supply restrictions, so I wasn't very clear whether it's, you know, uh, food restrictions within ASEAN, I, because I think um, there might have been some hiccups on that, uh, you, you know, on, on exports to us, other ASEAN neighbours, but by and large, uh, food supply chains were, were quite smooth, right? And then, or if we are talking about international food supply chains, well, what happens if someone defaults on, you know, a bilateral trade agreement or an international trade agreement? I don't know, in normal times, you just sue, right? Or, you know, you, you resolve it diplomatically um, before you get to the litigation stage. But in times of pandemic, and we have to remember that governments have, imagine if it's your own government and you're a food exporting country or an essentials product, um, exporting country, you know, you have a duty to your own citizens. If I were in government, I have a duty to my own citizens to make sure that they are fed, right? So, so for me, it's a, I mean, even though Singapore is a food importing country, I, I, I understand that, you know, you have to protect your own people. Every government, that's the job of every responsible government, you have to feed your people. Then, okay, so if that is a 
an insurmountable mountain. So what are we going to do? Then the government has to, you know, look for alternative resources. And, and this is kind of, you know, cross sectoral within, within the country as well. You know, it's not just the law, it's not just the government, but businesses, right? So let's say that if you're a food exporting country and your government has, has blocked off, you know, the supply to, to your export states, right? Actually, your big businesses, your MNCs who want to export food or essential products, they can lobby the government and actually they exert a lot of pressure. Somehow, inevitably, the these exports start to keep moving. But until that happens, we have to look for alternative resources. So what we have seen, not just in, in COVID-19 in the past few months, um, but also in, in previous shortages, is that if you don't want to sell, surely there is going to be, you know, some other country who's going to sell to you. And, and, and there is going to be a barrier, but eventually, that resolves. Of course, you might have to pay more, so on and so forth. I think many of us are, are dealing with higher prices at the moment. But, you know, management, I'm not saying that the problem will go away, but it's it's managing the issue that so that it doesn't, um, you know, become so bad, right? I mean, I'm not sure whether the other ASEAN member states had this problem, but in other economies and including Singapore for a short time, we ran out of toilet paper. Who knew that toilet paper right. was essential, right? So then the last thing on tourism, your guess is good as mine because I don't know what we're thinking and the logical thing that we're seeing is that it will have to be in bubbles of sort of like clean countries, right? And then as you get cleaner, a bigger bubbles, then, then this, this would move. But for now, these are plans, potential plans to put in place when things get much better. One last thing that I want to say is that um, on, on seeing the effectiveness of ASEAN uh, soft laws or, or, or hard laws in the region, not just for public health, is that we the, um, there are monitoring bodies in the ASEAN Secretariat and they, they are new, so they're going to carry out their job. In terms of public health, the ASEAN Cooperating um, um, Coordinating Council, so that's the foreign ministers, they are now tasked to make sure that everything that has been tabled for our public pandemic preparedness is going to be met. So, you know, in a few months' time, they will get a report card. Yeah, thanks. All right. Thank you, Shin Lee. Uh, for Professor uh, Ponchai, uh, can someone unmute? Thank yes. you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, let me respond to the question about what is the title I meant focus on. I think during the three months from the, uh, the, the regulation in place, I think government mostly focused on the safe of life of people. So they focus on the control of COVID crisis and pay less attention to the economic system. Um, I'm not saying that the government is, I mean, careless about uh, economic crisis after the COVID. However, at this current stage, the government tend to pay more attention to save the COVID. I mean, the people from the COVID contraction um, however, the government also paid a subsidy to the people in Thailand for three months for the um, less opportunity people. So every month, three months from April, May, June, every, I mean, I used the poor, poor, poor people in Thailand will, give, will get 5,000 baht, which is equal to about $200 each month for three months for the subsidies during the COVID. Um, then um, in the long term, this is of course the problem for Thailand to recover because one thing, Thailand's GDP is mainly um, pay attention from the, from the tourism, export and import as well. So this is the, another story that I have after, for me, I think after the, after the crisis of COVID, government has to pay more attention for the recovery of the economic system. Um, now, according to the source, the government are considering lifting the restriction soon because the restriction create the problem to the business because business cannot open freely. People will not easily um, 
go to the shopping mall or whatsoever, and people still scared of everything. So government now try to resume back to the economic system as soon as possible. Um, however, if you come to Thailand, you will see that the the emergency decree is sometimes used as the COVID control. However, in some cases, some criticism about government use that power in order to control the political unrest. Um, after, if every, I mean, scholars, not every, but most of the scholars in Thailand now, considering that um, after the lift of the COVID crisis restriction, there will be the political unrest. So this is another story that Thailand has to face with. Um, the government tend not to, I mean, tend, I think after they, they plan to lift the restriction as to make sure that economic system can come back. However, they have to make, they have to consider whether they can cope with the political unrest after that. Um, regarding to the food supply in Thailand, I'll go quick. The food supply in Thailand, um, we have no issue about import and export because we, we try to export and import as well for many countries. But only problem is that we cannot export to China. So most of the market in Thailand, we export, for example, durian and fruits to China. Now yeah. we have to consume in Thailand. So it's not, the supply is over. I mean, we, 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 we Send it to Jakarta. Yeah. yeah. And then that's, that's the issue. We don't have any issue with the food supply. Okay. Let's go to the third question. I think, um, it's not easy to amend the ASEAN framework of consensus and non-interference non at this point. I'm not saying that it is not possible. It is it's still possible that we can have the regional rules in ASEAN. But according to my research, it is very difficult to have that rules applicable to all the ASEAN because we, we are ASEAN move forward by the consensus and non non-interference. How can the regional rule become, I mean, the bigger umbrella to control everything? I mean, so in, I like to have the regional rules, but if not, for me, I think with the COVID and public health crisis, it's only focus on the cooperation will be the base and harmonize rules, not the regional rules at this stage. So this is my response to the question. All Thank right. You. Thank you uh, very much, Brother Ponchai. And Zoom, there's a two question for you specifically. First is regarding the use of mobile apps for screening in Vietnam, how could the public be sure that information put in the app are true? Okay. And secondly, during the pandemic, uh, how about the people itself and how about the law enforcement for those who break the law? Thank you. Zoom. Yes. Uh, wait, wait. Uh, unmute, please. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hello? Yes. Hello? Okay. Hello. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Uh, okay, for the apps, I think this is a, uh, I think it is a very um, uh, interesting in, uh, program by the, by the Ministry of Health. Actually, uh, as uh, you you see from the first slide of mine, the when the out, out when the, the outbreak of the of the when we have the first cases of uh, coronavirus, uh, the government have established the you know the national steering committee, and uh, they immediately they have the, the organized the task force throughout Vietnam. I think the the and the Ministry of Health have. Uh, uh, have uh, ex established a network uh, throughout Vietnam with the help of uh, uh, police, with the help of the local, um, uh, you know, the voluntary people, so uh, they they uh, so that they can get the uh, the the accurate information. In Vietnam, actually, they they uh, they have a very uh, comprehensive plan for the quarantine. You know, uh, they, we have we have divided we categorize people yeah by the group. For example, if uh, you got the, the the coronavirus, so everyone that you meet will be the uh, what we call F one, okay? And if uh, and if uh, they uh, and they, they will check uh, they check the F one and then they will check the, the people of F the the, the F one people uh, the, the people who meet with the F one. So they, they those people will come. We call the F F two, yeah F two. 
So uh, if you know, and with this kind of system, they have they they the government have uh, you know very very strict very strict control from very beginning. Yeah. So the, and all information will be will be provided to the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of uh, Telecommunication. So though, and and they would and, and and so. Uh, Vietnamese uh, and many people say at the beginning that didn't believe in this uh, information. Actually, from the beginning, many people don't believe in it is true. But I think that uh, the government have uh, uh, persuaded them by you know by, by the you know the, the, the action they're doing around. So uh, and then uh, when uh, and persuade people to use this app as you know as the as the tool to uh, let them know about the situation. So it is actually. Educating people, yeah, to cooperate with the with the with the government, with authorities, and and you know, in, in, in even my case, I have I got the problem, you know, and uh, this something ha happened to me, you now because in I live in the uh, in the in the condominium, and uh, you know the and uh, we have, and one day we were informed that there are some tourists from my uh, England came to our con uh, condominium. So uh, and then I told my my uh, my my my, par my 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 wife that maybe we would move to our uh, our uh, parents' house because landed property is more is more you know safe maybe. But then when we come there, you know, right at the corner already someone who got the become the F1, you know. So <laughs> the, the the police already there, the, the the ambulance there, and they took all people to the you know the to the hospital. So. I, so we later we decide okay we just come back to live in our in our house because in our place maybe is is you know, the, the severity is the same. So just to uh, use the, the the situation to illustrate that Vietnam Miss government have uh, taken very uh, very strong measures yeah to make sure that uh, that uh, the the, the country uh, they, they can control fully control the situation. But the second thing is the I think the the, the Vietnamese are very cooperative. I think they were I think when when they uh, I think they were uh, the propaganda by the government has uh, reached them, and they uh, they really cooperate. They don't they don't they just they just obey the instruction by the government. Yeah, so uh, I I think this is very important uh, because uh, you know we have like 90 million people, uh, population, and if uh, only uh, like you know one million people do not obey, then it will be a very big problems. But uh, fortunately, the during the the the, the Two months, the most severe parts, yeah, the, the phase three, my phase three, everyone were very cooperative, and uh, they all the you know you, if you come to Vietnam at time, all the shop were closed down, nobody go go out, uh, voluntarily, no no and no no the government don't need to do the, the, the any enforcement measures, yeah I think this is uh, something that uh, uh, I uh, very uh, uh, you know unique uh, for for us because. And I, I, I believe that uh, the, the, this is thanks to the very good uh, propaganda and the education to people through the media and through the social media as well, social networks, the Facebook, the the application, and you know they even they you know they they create sort of like something like the some uh, songs you know the the some kind of uh, very uh, 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 like the pop song to uh, and to play everywhere. So uh, people even the kids know how to. Uh, to uh, you know, to uh, do the uh, individual protections, and uh, yeah, so I think that uh, it helped us to overcome the situation very fast. Yeah, I think okay. this is also uh, answer the second question. <laughs> okay, yeah. thank you, thank you, uh, Professor Zung. Uh, thank you very much uh, for all the speakers. Uh, I guess. Uh, we we will never have uh, enough time to discuss all of these things, but. Uh, one thing for sure that uh, this uh, two, uh, mo two hours or more uh, our discussion, we have uh, shared our experience, our success story, our uh, you know uh, maybe even negative uh, experience. But then it, we can learn from each other on how we deal with this pandemic. I guess this is the whole point of communication, right? Yes. I guess uh, from country to country, each of the country has their own uh, efforts to. Uh, regulate uh, within uh, its own jurisdiction, but then when we uh, talk to each other, we can uh, we can share what is the success story and whether or not we can uh, develop uh, our common uh, common uh, policy that can work for everybody. At least in the in the area of uh, region like ASEAN, 
we know that ASEAN has uh, a number of uh, its limitation, but then it will not uh, stop us for uh, to cooperate from each other because uh, we as uh, individual state will not be able to uh, cope with this uh, uh, pandemic uh, by ourselves. And I guess with this kind of uh, forum, other uh, informal forum or even formal forum that everybody can sit together, talk to each other, I think it's uh, going to develop uh, all of this policy that can work for now and for the future. And I guess this, uh, 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 this uh, discussion uh, will not have any uh, specific uh, conclusion in which all of you will take uh, your own conclusion and we can take uh, all of the benefits from this uh, discussion to uh, our community, to our governments. And then I hope this discussion will also attract and trigger further uh, research and further uh, insights to be uh, written, to be published, so we, uh, we can uh, learn from each other. And my apology uh, to all the participants that have given your uh, questions. I, I think uh, your questions are very uh, uh, impressive. And I think uh, all of the speakers also know that and have a difficult this time to answer the question. I guess hopefully uh, maybe next year we can uh, see in, in person, maybe in Jakarta, in Singapore, in Chiang Mai, or even in Ho Chi Minh City. I guess... Yeah. Uh, I have to wrap up this uh, discussion. Thank you very much for the speakers, uh, for your time and for the participants. Uh, and I hope we can see you in the future and in, of course in the Gold Health. Thank you very much. I'm Ari Afriansha and see you again. Bye-bye. 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 Good day. Bye. Bye. <laughs>